Do you like books? I mean, really, really like books? Then you're in the right place. Each week, your host, Sam Hankin, interviews the best of today's top-selling authors and the up-and-coming superstars of modern literature. This is The Avid Reader. Here is your host, Sam Hankin. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another edition of The Avid Reader. Today, our guest is Ellie Williams, whose novel, The Liar's Dictionary, is being released today by Doubleday. Ellie's prize-winning debut collection of short stories, A Trib, or A Trib, whichever you choose, was published in 2017. Her stories have been anthologized in Penguin's British short story classics and in Liberating the Canon. She's a fellow of the Royal Society of Literature and teaches at Royal Holloway, University of London. Oh, she also supervised uh, young Fatak, if I pronounce it correctly, a journal for contemporary prose poetry, perhaps. I will list her research interests simply because one is a mountain weasel. Experimental fiction, yeah. Practice-based research, which actually is a thing. Short stories, lexicography, escovalience, and homo ludens. Uses of the passive voice, digression, with which I am very familiar. Mornington Crescent. Uh, nonsense literature, queer literature, and histories. She also parses the tenacious and the tenuous aspects of lots of things, too numerous to mention. Actually, I guess everything, tenuous existence and also a tenacious one. I mean, should a person's reach exceed his grasp and all, all of that. Anyway, my introductions tend to veer, as you all know, but I need to introduce the book as well now. So, at the end of the 1800s, Peter Winsworth, a lifter or not, is up to the S's, working at Swansby's Dictionary House. I like him very much. Cut to the present day, and we find Mallory at a dilapidated Swansby, where she attempts to complete the failing project and its digitization, as well as uncover a lexicographical, uh, lexicographical mystery and avoid being burned in hell, along with her partner, Pip. So for purposes of time, I will end my introduction right here now. Hello, Ellie, and thanks so much for joining us. Hello, thanks so much for having me. So I thought where we should begin, and perhaps we should begin with Lillian Virginia Mountain Weasel. Right, so that is a real fictitious entry that exists um, and has given its name to the uh, phenomenon of fictitious entries. Um, that was a real entry that appeared uh, in 1975 in a dictionary of biography. Um, and as you'd expect in a, a biographic dictionary, it includes in the entry details of her life, um, that she was born in Bangs, Ohio in 1933, I think, um, that she lived a life that involved taking photographs of famous uh, gravestones in prison graveyards, and that she died tragically very young while on commission for Combustibles magazine in an explosion. And as I'm sure you can pick up here, not only is this woman entirely made up, she's not a real person, um, but this entry is this kind of strange little short story. It's got wordplay in it. It's got absurd uh, twists uh, based on, on words about this completely fictitious person. Um, and she really, the, the fact of her existence in, in the column inches of the dictionary uh, really was the inspiration for, for a lot of this novel. This idea that someone will have sat down to write this little short story and included it in a real dictionary, something that's supposed to be about fact and about trustworthy resource. Um, and that kind of tension or, or friction between telling the truth uh, that we expect a dictionary to be and to do, um, and the idea of, of deception, of a kind of white lie or a mistruth or, or an untruth nestling there in, in the dictionary. So she's, um, she's not a character in the book, but she, I suppose, haunts the book and its, its genesis. Well, the book itself, then. Tell us a little bit about it. And in doing so, because... It was lovely the way in which the chapters, each headed with a letter and a word, kind of melded together. So I wasn't sure when I was going from Winsworth to Mallory, and that was really well done. But in, in discussing those two characters, perhaps you could kind of um, give us a synopsis of the book itself. 
Sure. Um, so the, the book, as you say, it's split in terms of focus between a 19th century uh, narrative uh, about a lexicographer called Peter Wentzworth, um, who is very put upon. He finds his job both boring and difficult, uh, and he's quite a small cog in quite a big machine. Um, and he takes it upon himself to express himself creatively by rather mischievously and surreptitiously inserting these fake words into the dictionary. Um, the second, the other part of the book uh, is set in the contemporary world, in contemporary London, where Mallory uh, is an intern at the same dictionary. Uh, and it is her role to find these fake entries, to find these words that Winsworth in the 19th century has inserted into the book. So they're kind of roped together as characters. They um, have a relationship of a kind of cat and mouse, one pursuing the other. But as the novel develops, um, as you mentioned, they also share this um, sense that words sometimes aren't enough, that their business is in working with words and wrangling words and shepherding words and considering words, but sometimes language for them falls short of um, being able to communicate how they're feeling and their individual circumstances. So they have a lot of um, sympathy to one another and their lives start to have a kind of resonance uh, through through time, even though they know that they'll never encounter one another. Um, in a way, it's kind of an echo of the relationship between a writer and a reader, between a text and an author. Um, and they're quite playful with one another in a way, um, Mallory and, and Winsworth. And I enjoyed, as you say, seeing how their experiences through narrative could be brought together, braided together in a way that is somehow more glancing than um, an interrogation or a pursuit of, of one another. Um, and it seemed like the set format of an alphabet uh, was a, a nice kind of arbitrary way of, of relegating and regulating uh, the ways in which they, they meet each other through the text. It's nice that you use the word playful because, I mean, first of all, there's this panoply of characters, all of which are well drawn, and we can't go into each of them. But when you say playful, I really love the way in which um, Pip and Mallory interact and their banter. And likewise, uh, Sophia and Wentzworth, when Wentzworth seems to come out of his shell and is very capable of dealing on his own lisp or not at that time with this lovely woman who has a somewhat complicated character. And the banter is almost like an old uh, screwball comedy, like with mm -hmm. Cary Grant and Catherine Hepburn or something like that. And uh, you must have had fun doing that. I did. I, I love the idea of Cary Grant and Catherine Hepburn popping up in a kind of casting of this. I'm, I'm glad that that comes out of the text because it, it was fun to write. And I think often, if I think about dictionaries and if I think about uh, the people that make dictionaries, I don't know about you, but I, it often feels like a very noble pursuit. It feels like a, quite a rigid and um, uh, intellectual uh, as well as ambitious uh, exercise. But because dictionaries are made by human beings who are flawed and hubristic, um, I wanted to bring some of that spirit of the flawed and difficult and funny, often very funny, eccentricities that go into making a dictionary. Um, and I hope that through through these characters, both in the 21st century London and in the 19th century London, um, that some of that came through. And as you said before, in terms of um, the absurd and the nonsensical and the surprising that, you know, our, our worlds include that every day. So I think that that should be included in, in a fictional world where people can be banterous and mischievous um, as much as they can be tentative and forthcoming. Um, and I really, I really wanted to get some, some of that verve across uh, in the text. So it wasn't too plodding or too, I suppose, self-satisfied in um, being indulgent with, with words. Um, I wanted to have a few pratfalls and, and slapstick as well. Plus, there's the purposeful ones, like an eclair being long in form and short in duration. Yeah, that's 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 actually a real one from from Chambers Dictionary. 
Um, and I mean, you get a, a sense there of how lexicographers enjoy their task that um, and kind of uh, aren't always at pains to make sure that the definitions in their dictionaries are um, just useful and functional. They can also be idiosyncratic and, and memorable in, in that way. So um, I want to go through some scenes that, well, since it's coming out today, no, no one has read it yet except for me. <laughs> a few others, but they'll just have to deal with that. But talk a little bit about Winsworth's lisp, and now I'm just going to start with this thing, um, how it arose, and uh, and then the upshot of having to um, forcibly visit Dr. Rochefort uh, Smith. Yeah, so uh, the character Winsworth, he, from an early age, realized that if he included a lisp in his speech patterns, that people tended to treat him slightly more gently. Um, that involved a certain amount of, of patronizing him, um, but he found that he was able to operate in the world and be and experience the world with people being slightly kinder to him. And so he thought, well, I may as well just keep this up. Um, and he kind of becomes uh, trapped in his, the, his own snare there in that he has to keep this up for the rest of his life to the extent where he's sent by his employer, Swansby Dictionary, um, while he's working on the S's uh, and having to lisp his way through all these um, work placements um, and definitions, uh, he's sent by his employers to a speech therapist um, in order that his lisp might be, in inverted commas, cured. Um, so as ever, uh, poor hapless Winsworth is having to deal with the consequences of what he thought was just a, a light bit of mischief that wouldn't necessarily affect anyone or cause any any harm or really have any traction in the world. Um, he's having throughout the, the novel to um, stick to that lie uh, and and suffer the consequences somewhat. Yeah, that, that was, um, it was fun to write that uh, because in part, seeing how a character that you, you build up an affection for, um, maybe just by dint of, of habit of having to, to be with him for so long, um, and really making him squirm quite a lot, um, having to use sentences with S words in it, uh, and having to see how best to write him so that he's able to avoid them or not able to avoid those circumstances. Um, not least, as you say, having a love interest called Sophia, um, that he can't necessarily name without um, falling into that performance of, of lisping. And working, um, working on S's in the dictionary as well. Yeah, cool um, man. <laughs> so the, some, of the, some of the first definitions are botanical in nature. And um, that's interesting. And also birds are throughout the novel, which is interesting as well. But um, Dr. Rookford Smith's bird is, is he's, he or she is a character in the book as well because he totally flummoxes uh, and that made me laugh but I laughed out loud throughout this book and um, so <laughs> I want to know if you laughed when you wrote this when <laughs> I, that's a lovely portrait of the writer just oh. <laughs> I, I, I'm not much for laughing out loud when I'm writing it's more of the kind of angry moaning um, uh, but I did enjoy writing I suppose the the, the cameo of the um, the bird in the birdcage um, because uh, in the first chapter with Winsworth um, he has a hangover because he's been at this birthday party the day before uh, the night before, rather. And um, at the time, in 1899, the word hangover, in its understood sense, hadn't existed in dictionaries yet. Obviously, people used it um, verbally in conversation, but it hadn't yet entered the dictionary. Um, and I loved this idea of a lexicographer who doesn't have a word yet for the thing that he's experiencing. Um, and for that to be something that preoccupies him, Plus, with his headache, he also has this songbird just blaring out at him while he's trapped in this unneeded speech therapist appointment. Um, there is, a, I suppose, a kind of um, 
psychopathy at play there and, and making your characters, as I say, swarm a little. Um, but with Winsworth, there is a certain delight um, in ensuring that he gets into these scrapes really by dint of, of his own uh, ill planning or his, his previous mischief. Um, and I did enjoy writing them. Um, probably not laughing out loud, but uh, having a, a wry eyebrow raise occasionally, <laughs> certainly. And these birds become eye to eye with him, the bird in the cage and the pelican. Oh, here's one that, well, I was reading it last night and I was getting angry at you because <laughs> I every word I had to look up, thank God for Google, because going to Webster's would have been a nightmare, especially in bed. And um, so I immediately memorized all of them and now I've forgotten all of them. But, okay, so this is what I was doing. It was like two o'clock in the morning and my partner was sleeping soundly. But when I read, there he experienced one of the most exotic disappointments possible as his fingers closed firmly around an uneaten slice of birthday cake. So I woke her up <laughs> and read it to her and she was, suffused as well if suffused is <laughs> but you had to laugh when you wrote that didn't you <laughs> i enjoyed with um again with with winsworth because he's having to say these ridiculous lines that involve a lot of kind of uh dexterity from his his mouth and his jaws and he's having to fake this lisp um that was fun coming up with with those lines uh that would would really put him on the spot um and it's funny you say about the having to to check the definitions of, of words that are either obscure or, or esoteric because um, I when I was writing it very much was also similarly doing a ricochet between my desk and ensuring that I had either the right word or a word that was fuck? right was not in a way more interesting was using words that actually weren't quite right that were either too specific or were not specific enough. Um, because again, that has the hapless lexicographer um, also being shown up by language itself, something that he should have at his fingertips or something that should be some facility or faculty that comes easily to him. Um, and I think, I don't know if you have this too, but there is a certain delight in coming across a word that isn't recognizable to you. And then you feel, well, I'm going to store this away and be able to use it at the next possible opportunity when I will be the only one in the room that knows why gloom or forb would be perfect. Um, and it's a, a kind of precocious, winsome, sweet, personal kind of treasure hunt that you set up for yourself in doing that. And inevitably that word then evaporates and you never remember it. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I, you, you are not alone in, um, thanking Google for, for the accessibility of, of definitions. Uh, that definitely was part of the writing process as well. And it's funny because what set me off was the word exotic. <laughs> it just, it's an exotic disappointment. And I guess it would be if you reached into your pocket and there it was, but. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Paul Winsworth doesn't have many opportunities to enjoy the exotic. So that's probably as exotic as it gets for him, I think. But he did eat the cake, which I thought, I don't know, but <laughs> he but, needs to get his highs where he can get them, I think. <laughs> and as long as we're speaking of birds, which we will be. And because you put it in your CV or your resume that you are the titular head of the, if I, I can't pronounce it, nor can anyone in the dictionary, the young, young attack. Uh, society. Explain how that bird works, or those birds, singularly or plurality. Uh, well, let me see. So I've included it in the epigraph of um, of the novel, uh, and it's from a, a syndicate version of a Webster's, a real Webster's dictionary um, that came out, uh, I think, in 1943, 1943. Um, and there in the J, uh, amongst the Js, another kind of bird, in the J words, um, there's Jungftak, uh, that's how I pronounce it, but as you say, who knows? Noun, a Persian bird, the male of which had only one wing on the right side and the female only one wing on the left side. Instead of the missing wings, the male had a hook of bone and the female an eyelet of bone. And it was by uniting hook and eye that they were enabled to fly. 
each, when alone, had to remain on the ground. And again, like Lillian Virginia Mountweasel, entirely made up. There is no Persian bird like that, either in, in fiction or in fact. Um, and this is one of these fictitious uh, entries that, unlike Lillian Virginia Mountweasel, no editor has ever claimed that word. They've never said, oh, yeah, that's one of ours. I made that up. Um, so it exists. Is it a mistake that it got in there? Is it a hoax? Is it that it was some lexicographer's last day on the job and they said, I'll just sneak this one in? Um, it kind of just sits there in, in the undergrowth um, of, of the Webster's Dictionary. And I really love it as a fictitious entry because it it has as part of the little short story really of it, um, this idea of a bird that is unable to take flight. And that for me is almost like a word in a dictionary that no one uses or that no one knows is there, that this is a word that doesn't have currency, that the, we, we can't share, that doesn't have a, a meaningful existence in the way that other words as part of language must and, and have to. Um, so it, Jungfertag has a very particular place in my heart. Um, and I, uh, I think maybe I delight in part in that I have no idea how to pronounce it either. And it, it maybe puts yeah. me on the spot as well as everyone else. Uh, I prefer the T to be silent. It would be a lot easier. Is there, is there really a society and you are the head of it or is it like the rest of your resume? <laughs> It is. It exists as a, a prose poetry website. Um, I do. I do run it uh, and and vet it, and I encourage uh, readers to read it and to submit their prose poetry to it. Um, but it, it is very much my own little project, rather than something that I can, um, in any way, make anyone else's problem. <laughs> so if we go on to the next bird, the pelican, and that scene again, I was laughing profusely, especially the first because the sun corrects his mother when she says that the pelican can break your arm. Even as a little boy, he is able to use the proper word that you're thinking of swans. Yeah, yeah, that was a that was a fun scene. I think in part because a lot of my writing, um, for good or for ill, it is about words and is about people either using or misusing language. And I don't often get to write action scenes. So that was an opportunity to actually get Winsworth out of the office um, and to see what, what he's made of, to test his metal a little bit. And unfortunately, it being Winsworth, um, it's not a necessarily impressive fight scene that he's able to enjoy. But um, yes, poor, poor Pelicans and poor Lexicographers is really the subtitle to this, this whole uh, novel. Especially since Winsworth initially attacks the pelican and then, um, but he does say, although it's a lie, that he can control the bird and then does wrap his jacket around and is successful. And because it's Sophia, again, these different things, Sophia smacks him across the head with her umbrella across the ear and then uh, talks about her expertise in Bartitsu, uh, which I said, is that real? And then I looked it up and it is real. And then the, the, the uh, colloquy about a matador, the light-limbed matador. <laughs> and when he calls him a nervy bit of a brute. And, uh, and then the geese come in. And, <laughs> and yeah, then, just flocks well, of birds just <laughs> completely arbitrarily coming by. Yeah. So I thought that was clever because in my mind I thought, I think the pelican is a red herring. <laughs> You may be right. No spoilers here. I think for me, a lot of um, the 19th century literature that I enjoy um, the most uh, often is kind of pivoted towards towards children nowadays. But um, Lewis Carroll with, with Alice in Wonderland and Edward Lear with his nonsense poetry. Um, and both of those authors often use animals in quite interesting ways and, and often anthropomorphize those those animals or think about them in terms of, of glossaries um, and narratives. Uh, and I really wanted the pelican to kind of be a nod to, to that, the idea of a slightly uh, absurd uh, encounter with a creature then being quite a protracted and um, important moment for both of these characters, like a moment of crisis and tension where the stakes aren't really high for anyone. 
um, this, uh, you know, should just be a, a gentle stroll in the park and an encounter between two people that have an attraction for one another. And the fact that a pelican comes out of it is the most memorable thing, I think, um, again, is, is in keeping with this idea of, of Paul Winsworth not necessarily always being in control of, of his own narrative and what might make him interesting and um, individual or, or uh, of, of any particular note. Um, and I was also glad that I could get Sophia um, knocking a, a, a bird on the head with an umbrella, I think, <laughs> bring in some kind of physical com comedy and, and pantomime. I even had to look up pictures to see if you could take a shoelace and wrap it around the beak and then give the bird a tracheotomy. Right. I should say that um, my my elder sister uh, is a trained veterinarian um, and I did have to ring her up and be like, is it possible to give a, a pelican a tracheotomy with a, with a snapped off pen? And I think she's had weirder questions put her way before, um, but she's assured me that it might be possible. So that's the caveat I have to put in, uh, the kind of small print, in case any pelicans write in and are unsure. <laughs> that was the least of your work. <laughs> <laughs> right. um, and then these themes of, as I said, the, the botanical words, the birds, and then there's this ineffable... Uh, theme of orange and its uh, synonyms in three different cases um, in the doctor's office and the bird and everything in the and then he goes through the litany of words and then um, later on in modern times again but most prominently in the explosion the train explosion because he wants so badly to know the exact right word because that's what his life's about and he even asked you know what he even when he's rescued or helped he even asked what what exact color was it and it's so interesting that your life would become that you know yeah i for me the idea that um we can never have that specificity of experience i i might describe one color as orange and you might describe the same color as orange but we're not ever sure we're seeing the same color um and i think that um that for winsworth is a is a, a crisis moment um that he realizes that his own individual uh, reckonings and realizations aren't necessarily always communicable or they may never be um, communicable through language um, and I enjoyed having in in the novel these nice flare-ups of, of orange and how it's kind of dogging him as as a color and as a, a crisis um, both from his hungover headache in the doctor's um, waiting room uh, t through to this explosion and to this realization um for him that the words sometimes fall short of, of what they they might be as as useful or, or functional um stabilizers really um but no i i it was um interesting coming up for synonyms for orange um <laughs> and uh see how far i could come up with them before uh, professor google came to my rescue can you remember the exercise that the doctor uses to assist Wentzworth in ameliorating his lisp? I'd love to hear you say it. <laughs> A roseate blush with soft suffusion divulged her gentle mind's confusion. And then, um, where can I do it? Okay, so Scytherism. Again, I wasn't sure. But then I looked at Mortimer Collins' The Secret of a Long Life. Uh, in a dictionary where he goes, <laughs> another day the sweet south is blowing. Do you not see how the larch and lime palpitate with pleasure? Do you not hear the musical scytherism of the feathered foliage? <laughs> oh gosh, scytherism of the feathered foliage. Yeah, that <laughs> I'll be interested to listen to the audio book and to see what the poor actors have been put through <laughs> for this That's purpose. That's difficult. Have you picked someone to read it yet? Um, I know that the two actors, certainly the, the UK edition, have um, they had a, a female actor for the Mallory sections and a male actor for, for Winsworth. 
Um, and I have not listened to it yet, uh, but I may have that portion set as my ringtone <laughs> or alarm clock or something like that. <laughs> it's, it's funny because it's, um, again, in the dictionary, when you talk about the camel leopard and the giraffe, and this always irritates me, but it happens when you look up camel leopard, it says see giraffe, when you look giraffe, it says see camel leopard. And um, that's another theme of the book that, you know, and I was going to ask you this earlier in, in our question answer period, is what are words and what are the words that mean something and what are the words that should mean something but don't exist? And that really is the essence of the whole thing. Yeah, and I mean, if we think about how much we trust a dictionary, we also trust that the, the person or the persons who have edited it and compiled it, that they have um, been fair and just in how they have not only defined the words, but chosen the words that have been defined. Um, and often, I mean, in the UK, the I'd say the major dictionary um, right now is, is the Oxford English Dictionary. And often when you're looking up words there just to, to check the definition or just for, for interest or for the, the joy of it, um, if you have too much time on your hands, uh, it'll have a word um, and then it'll say obsolete after it. And of course, by dint of one looking up that word, that word is not obsolete. It, it has a currency because I want to know what it means. Um, so the notion of how words enter the dictionary, when is word slang and when is it to be registered as standard English, um, what words are overlooked or what words are kind of combed out um, as if there's only so much space for words to function and, and exist, um, I think is, is really interesting to me. And to see how different um, would it does it make a difference when dictionaries are online? So they could be infinite rather than just um, have so many volumes that can bear so much weight on a, on a bookshelf. What um, how does that uh, make the decisions of a lexicographer for different or more generous uh, or more particular? Um, and when is a word an expletive? When is a word uh, something to do with tenderness and the, and the community? Like who makes those decisions and what does that say about the person making those decisions? That's um, interesting. I remember when the Oxford English Dictionary, the OED was like 20 volumes long and then there were addenda volumes. And then as I sell at the bookstore, there were the two volumes in the case with you opened it up and there was the magnifying glass. And I always prided myself at parties or whatever that I was able to read the four pages per page without glasses. And then they did like eight pages per page. <laughs> and I was still able to read it without the magnifying glasses. And I, at my age, I'm beginning. I still can almost do it, which I really think is wonderful of me. I think it is. You know, you you listed my CV before. If I could do that, that would be right at the top. <laughs> I'd be like, and challenge me, try. <laughs> like, just see how well I do it. No, that that is also a very handsome object book as object as well the i the idea of having its own little drawer with a dedicated magnifying glass that that's very pleasing um and and that's in the book as well the idea of how a, a dictionary as a thing that can be approached uh, or a thing that is sitting in a position of literal kind of heavy authority um to be monolithic and to draw the eye in a room rather than something that's a tool and useful that it can be intimidating actually the bulk of a dictionary and the sheer amount of words to be encountered within it um i think yeah the the idea of a dictionary as uh, as an object is of interest to to me and and i try to think around it as a subject in the book as well and it's funny because Owning a bookstore, I have, I guess it's not really a love-hate relationship with printed books, but now it's so easy to just take the Oxford Dictionary with you on an airplane mm. and 100,000 other books. And with my iPad, I can take notes. I can look up the definition, which is very helpful in this book. Mm. There's so much I can do, yet every day someone comes into the store and says, you know, I love the feeling of a book basically holding the author in my hand or 
I've always wanted library letters, and so I'm able to have library letters at my bookstore, which makes me so happy. But when some someone goes up the library ladder, they're looking for a particular book, but they also see the book on either side. And that might be the book that changes their life completely. So there are it's still there's still a reason. It's like it's like candles. There's no reason for candles anymore. But <laughs> yeah, I think sell, that's they sell that's more really than good books. point. No, definitely. And and similarly, that just as one browses a, a bookstore, a bookshop, and it's not the one that you came in to find that is the one, as you say, that's going to change your life. Similarly, reading a dictionary, yes, you may be getting down the volume to look up a particular word, but your eye will just ricochet across the columns and you'll suddenly be finding out about the etymology of spider as a word that suddenly means something to you and you'll think about it every day without realising it. Um, and that is an indulgent use of time, but but words have been used for far worse things than indulgences. And I think that um, physical dictionaries will always have an appeal for that reason. Um, to get lost in it, uh, to get lost in a good dictionary, I think is um, a marvelous thing. Um, the other thing I, I do at the bookstore is I have a coffee, a cafe. And so when Pip is working and someone <laughs> A grande wet latte frap all foam half soy with soft soft edge <laughs> and so at the bookstore because i have the luxury to do it i say if you can't order your coffee in three words or less please <laughs> yeah no synonyms here thank you very much <laughs> double tall lattes as much as they can do after that they have to leave or <laughs> right. i've actually done that yeah. You're not in the, the market for a coffee. You're here for elaboration. Get out. <laughs> Get out yes. of my store. If you're, in the, if, if you're in my store for the wrong reason. Yes, I would like two feet of books to go behind my sofa. Right. You know, well, here's a story you can go <laughs> to, but all the books are in Swedish, but they have. <laughs> oh, very good. May I recommend that they buy 40 copies of The Liar's Dictionary by Ellie Williams? <laughs> oh, uh, the other word is there's a word I can't pronounce it. Mendesiloquensis. How do you pronounce that? Mend. Oh, gosh, I've no idea. Uh, you have men to. <laughs> on the spot. Uh, Mendesiloquensis. Mendesiloquensis. No Mendesiloquensis. That um, sounds good. But it's obsolete, and there's something tragic in your book about obsolete words. You you feel bad for them. Yeah, I kind of feel that a neglected word has the kind of um, a kind of grandeur to it, a bit like an heirloom that's been lost. You know, um, it it may have uh, it may be a bit grimy, it may be easily overlooked, and it may have been well handled and eroded a little bit. But there's something very moving about um, an obsolescent word or an obsolete word um and she uses words poorly there in that uh, little expression um but also there's there's something chilling as well about words that could be obsolete so for example um there was some furore that i think i mentioned in the novel uh with the oxford junior dictionary uh, which is intended for for children and for people that are um first learning languages or expanding their their vocabulary um and between editions, they wanted to get rid of what stuck in my mind was the word aerodrome. Um, and that's one of those words that, yeah, I don't use it every day, but if I saw it on a sign, I might think to myself, well, what is the difference between an aerodrome and an air hangar or an airport? And if that was taken out of a dictionary, if that was no longer something that I could look up, I would feel the lack of it. Um, and it becomes almost kind of a ghost story that you just feel the trace of these words, but aren't able to encounter them fully or, or investigate them. Um, so I, I think they are. I find the idea of an ob obsolete word quite compelling. Um, yes. An aerodrome is a better word. It's a. It sounds. I, I agree. <laughs> I think that's that's also part of it that the kind of um, an enjoyment of words can be one that's nothing to do necessarily with use it's to do with the look of it on the page or to do with the the feel of it in the mouth um to do with the architecture of, of the glyphs of the letters uh, on the page um 
And the idea that just because it's not necessarily in use according to a certain frequency um, or metric uh, doesn't seem to reflect actually what can be thrilling or, or interesting about, about language necessarily. And the other way that words, especially now, are leading us is, as an example, which I find difficult to say, there was a council member in Washington, D.C., and in Washington, D.C., you shouldn't have done this. There was no reason to do it. But during the course of a meeting, he used the word niggardly, and he was fired. But it has nothing to do with a word you can't say. And the derivation is obviously completely different, and it's an A. Um, but that's what's happening to other words. They it's leave because they're in. They're it's interesting that um, one of the most popular accounts often on, on my timeline on Twitter is the Merriam-Webster uh, dictionary. Um, and a large part of the reason of its popularity is because whenever um, any unnamed current president um, has a speech and makes certain claims, they they don't need to supply a commentary to uh, check his language or to say this is untrue or this is a mistruth or this is disingenuous. They will just tweet out the definition of the word to say, well, no, look, this is what actually is in the dictionary. This is what this word means and how we should be using it. Um, so Merriam-Webster thus becomes this organ for satire and this important kind of um, checking resource uh, to ensure that language still does mean something. It can't just be that someone is able to, to use words for their own ends. Um, and, and maybe in a way that, that coheres with, with the incident that, that you're mentioning, that um, we use and have dictionaries for a purpose so that we are able to understand one another better. Hopefully that's the ideal, um, rather than uh, maybe be... A, a little trigger happy uh, with what we assume is the intention um, or, or otherwise. It can't happen too often because I think that Trump has, I think his vocabulary may be 2,000 words, perhaps, if that many. Yeah. <laughs> so he has about as many words as a 12 year old, maybe a 10 year old. Uh, or some. You know, the next. next press conference, get him to define aerodrome and we'll see how it goes. Or pronounce Yosemite. Um, you know, it's funny too, because you say, you say perhaps dictionaries are unreliable narrators, which may very, which apparently is very well true. But then it's funny because for the most part, your, your characters do not seem to be unreliable narrators. I mean, Sophia is Sophia, but you can kind of glean who she is. And and uh, same with Winsworth and Frasham. Uh, he's a bounder and a cad, and he just is. There's no two questions about it. Um, and the other thing is, as I ramble, um, Pip is such a lovely woman. I fell in love with her. She just, she just is such a lovely person. And no wonder Mallory's in love with her, you know? I really wanted to, I'm, I'm glad that that came across because I wanted Mallory, who is quite introspective, is quite tentative, is, is often quite unsure about what she feels or how she's able to uh, advocate for herself in, in many ways. Um, and her partner, Pip, is not like that. It's someone for whom words are not a problem and love and tenderness are, are things to be treasured rather than things to be deconstructed and, and worried about. Um, and I, I wanted Mallory to have a pip in her life um, to show that that was possible and a good thing um, rather than something impossible or, or too strident and um, nothing to do with, with love or passion. Um, so I, I'm very glad that, that she came off the page well for you. Yeah. She did. And the other thing is, being a parochial old white man for a long time, I didn't realize that Mallory was a woman. And I don't know if you mm -hmm. did on purpose, but, and perhaps it was because of the teabag reference, because I wasn't sure whether, I wasn't sure whether that was applicable in another situation with people of the same sex. I mean, you know, 
for the British and their tea bags. <laughs> There's a whole other uh, novel and memoir in, in that, I'm sure. So you have noun or a verb, and she says rude. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so we haven't discussed the. I was just thinking of Pip and how she handled it as different than Mallory, but talk about the anonymous caller and what he says in his digitized voice. Well, he's, so uh, the Swansby's Dictionary, they're um, having these phone calls, these sinister phone calls um, that seem to be to do with the definition of marriage changing uh, in, in the dictionary. Um, and in a way, this is based on, on a real event um, to do with the Larousse Dictionary, so the, the premier dictionary in, in France. Um, and they changed the definition of marriage in that dictionary to reflect the fact that both legally and socially, um, it wasn't enough to say that marriage means um, could be defined by the uh, wedded uh, union between a man and a woman. That was no longer the true definition of what a marriage could be. Um, and there was uproar uh, in Paris when that change was made um, and, uh, you know, one of one of the most notable and, and worst fallouts of that was that uh, a very conservative uh, historian, he actually shot himself in Notre Dame Cathedral um, in protest at this change happening. Um, and the idea that a change in a dictionary and an editorial um, decision that's made to reflect how language is useful and is used uh, in society that is is necessary for a dictionary to be relevant um, could lead someone to uh, not only protest um, but also uh, threat harm physical harm uh, in in the real world rather than in a, a world of words um, really the the incident of the the anonymous caller with the uh, strangely changed voice, synthesized voice coming down the line. Um, it's this threat that is being made to the dictionary house, but that Mallory feels in particular because she is uh, a gay woman um, who is still uh, not quite um, understanding her own sexuality or, or certain elements of, of who she is as a person. Um, and she is the one, the intern, who has to answer the phone and has to, to reckon with this anonymous caller. Um, so that's a part of the novel where language um, as, as something um, intellectual but also practical is also shown as something that can be used against someone, um, that it's not a case of one is always in control of the words that we use or the words that are applied to us, but there can be a notion uh, or a note of caution struck there and of tentativity and of power imbalances. Um, and that, that was something that I, I wanted to include in the book as well, uh, in amongst the humour and, and glibness, um, that the fact that we are not always um, used kindly by language uh, as much as we don't always use lang language kindly. I love the way that uh, when Pip takes the call and goes off on the guy and then when she hangs up, <laughs> Mallory said he was he had hung up. She goes, yes, he hung up immediately. But I loved saying what I said. Yeah, uh, I think I think there's a lot to be said for people being brave, uh, even when the threat may not necessarily be there. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, I could give some spoilers away now, but I won't. Um, <laughs> although I thought some of the reviews did did not tread lightly enough on the plot. They talked too much about the plot. I think. I always think that. Um, so toward the end, oh, so is is there this room at the British Museum? There certainly was. I believe now it's a locker that's kept under uh, lock and key um, of all these um, obscene esoteric erotica uh, that has been either gifted or um, supplied to the British Museum. Um, yeah, it definitely did exist. The secretum, which is a, a interesting word. Um, and uh, for the purposes of, of the novel, um, it was one that 
uh, as a room could be hired out to various uh, ne'er-do-wells um, for flamboyant parties. Um, I'm pretty sure uh, that that was never the case. You'd have to check with a, a historian of curatorship. Um, but again, the idea of there being these secret little rooms that, um, uh, for editorial notions of probity should not be accessible to the general public. That seems so at odds with what a museum could be or should be. Um, that seems similar to me to the idea that a dictionary, which is supposed to espouse truth or communicate clearly what language might mean and could be defined, having fake entries in it, it seemed like a nice parallel. So I was glad that I could could include it there in the, in the narrative. And then Pip is upset because she can't find pornography in the dictionary. I mean, these filthy interns have too much time on their hands. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah, they looked up, they all looked, and I did too. That's right. the first thing I did. In the <laughs> what, not necessarily for a purian interest, but simply to see if, did they include this? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'll see I definitely, there's, um, I don't know if you've read, uh, is it Fun House by Alison Bechdel? Um, but there's a very touching scene there um, in a, it's a graphic memoir um, by Alison Bechdel. Uh, she, her, well, her character, the protagonist, but it is her. Um, in the, in one of the comic panels um, is shown looking up in the dictionary, kind of queer and lesbian and, and various anatomical words out of both the sense of kind of prurience and, and like, oh, that would be quite titillating, but also a sense of, well, what am I? What am I trying to understand about myself? And it's very moving um, in the context of, of that graphic memoir um, to see how uh, a character, a protagonist is trying to find the right, the right words for herself. Um, and I think that, that that can be tackled with humor and that can be um, tackled with a kind of sociological why is it that there's that frisson, that tension of, of seeing something uh, rude or something that we're, uh, we're meant to censor uh, and not talk about in polite society um, and yet to see it in black and white and to understand and to recognise oneself um, through looking up definitions. That's something I wanted to, to include in the novel too. And it's fun because one of the most telling one is simply three letters and it's the word out. And Pip and Mallory tussle about, okay, what what does out actually mean? Because Pip has always been out and Mallory is still not out. But it's just a three letter word, but it has so much meaning in it. And I thought that was interesting too, because you, you veered from what you were talking about into this little segue of what am I, how do I, how do I portray myself? And just using three letters. Yeah, and I think that's this idea of um, that being out uh, is a is a kind of divulgence and a declaration and a freedom, um, but that there's also this sense. Well, you don't need to define yourself for anyone. You just need to be yourself. Um, I think is something that the the characters are, are either grappling with or are realizing has to be uh, brought into their uh, how they live truly and how they can um, be at terms with themselves. Yeah. And once again, you can't leave well enough alone. So you then go to the closet and then <laughs> discuss whether the closet is the right word because it's just not something that people, it's just, you know, brooms and mops. And <laughs> right. Just like sexuality, just brooms and mops, basically, when it comes down to it. <laughs> Actually, that's exactly right. <laughs> oh, and the word for lubrication, which I've forgotten. What is it? Oh, gosh, now I forget. Uh, I'm glad you forget these things. <laughs> makes me yeah, feel so my, much better. I just write about dictionaries and encyclopedias. I haven't. <laughs> no, it all goes out of the window. <laughs> it also has, you know, well, it has the one meaning, but it also deals with uh, mollusks or clams or oysters and the, and you really you really get this tactile sense and actually Pip and Mallory both understand what it means and finally oh yeah now I understand what this word means because I've always understood it but I never had a name that I could place upon it which happens all the time 
Yeah, yeah. In fact, now I do remember it. Um, I kind of looked over there as if there was something that reminded me that's not the case. Um, but Cyprine, which is this word that um, I came across, as it were, in uh, something called the uh, Materials for a Lesbian Dictionary, which is by Monique Wittig. Um, and it's it's kind of a novel. It's very playful. It imagines a world where uh, only women exist on an island like like the mythical Amazons and how would society function if that was the case and how would they make a dictionary to define their changed world um, and she includes it's, it's written in French and in the um, in the translation in English this word supreme um, meaning kind of female uh, lubrication um, and I wanted to in the book have these women uh, these female characters realise that they don't have a word for that thing that they know exists and that they might want to talk about, might need to talk about, um, and that they could think of 700 different slang words for the male equivalent, even though that has really no place in their lives at all. Um, and that, you know, we were talking before about obsolete words, that this is a word that is not um, existent for them. It's not something that they have any recourse to ask about or pursue um, and how that was a strange lacuna in, in their world. Um, and I, it, that was, that was fun to, to write about. And again, quite moving actually um, to, to consider. Have you read, I assume you have, the, this time out, Lillian Mount uh, Liesel and the incredible Young Frack by um, Mark Sackler? No, I don't think I have. You should. I will. Lillian Mount Weasel and the Incredible Young Flat Flat. And um, he has a blog. His name is yeah, you know, his name is Mark Sackler and he has a blog called Time Out. Um, and it's about nonsense and nonsensical words. So I just mm -hmm. came across that was the other thing, it's the rabbit hole thing. You know, I don't know how I found it. I found it this morning and I didn't mean to find it. And that's the fun of it all. It's not, yeah. I have no idea. And, and then when I find it, it's like, oh, wow, you know? And that's what's so much fun about all of this. And I don't think everybody, well, like say, for example, Trump or any of his acolytes would ever think that this is something that you might want to do <laughs> with your life or with, uh, with your leisure. Um, and that's sad, but it's true. I think often part of it, part of the joy of it is because it's it can be incidental rather than something that's sought out so if it was the case that um you know you you said I'm going to put two hours of my day aside for falling down a rabbit hole that feels that that feels like a strange way to spend your time but if you look up from falling down the rabbit hole and realize you've been doing this for, for two hours that you've been following hyperlinks um from various articles that interest you um it's that that kind of enjoyable loss of time that that being in the moment and in that pursuit of interest just driven and motivated by interest um that it it i can't imagine a a better way to spend a day <laughs> um but also a more privileged uh way of, of having the time to to spend time doing that yes and it, it also you, uh, you approach it from i guess more of an obtuse angle but um Lewis Carroll and nonsense, which you do. And I assume that everything you list there, other than the things that don't exist, are things that you really do, correct? Yeah. So, <laughs> and at first I didn't even know, you know, I read it and I thought, so then I started looking them up and I go, I can't believe she did this. <laughs> I mean, I do think some of my students that, uh, you know, they'll, they'll get in touch with me for a, a proposal for an essay and they're like, I too am really interested in, and they're like, Mornington Crescent, <laughs> why, why have you included that? Um, so no, again, that's probably time well spent uh, just noodling around with a, <laughs> with a CV online. Um, but uh, no, I, I think there is lots to be, learnt from nonsense that's that's the irony of it um that with nonsense literature uh it raises a smile because it is obtuse or it's absurd um but also in trying to understand it in in trying desperately to make jabberwocky the poem make sense you suddenly are thinking about grammar you're thinking about syntax you're thinking about word associations that are coming to you um and and 
notions of prosody and meter and why is it that we have any sense of what's going on in a Lewis Carroll poem uh, when it is entirely uh, without meaning. Um, and I think there's there's a game that's being played there that is enjoyable and is about meaningfulness as much as it is about what is meaningless. You know, for all the other reasons that I admired John Lennon, I always admired, well, like when he was 23 years old, how he wrote in his own right and a Spaniard in the works, you know, kind of <laughs> James Joyce. I just, I'm wondering how could he have been so smart in so many ways, but be that as it may. Um, well, we've spoken, we have talked for about an hour. I could, I could talk for another two hours about the book, but um, because I have my bookshop and today is the first day of release, we have the book there that we are pre we cannot sell it and it has the tape over it and do not. Oh. <laughs> I always do anyway. But but everyone was kind, you were kind enough to send me the proof a while ago, which says proof on every page, which is quite distracting. It's a, <laughs> 50 point type in the middle of something right thinking does it <laughs> what does it mean are they proofing it is there <laughs> long here should i look closely at it but it doesn't mean that at all it's just so yeah. that's a good idea though maybe the second edition will just have kind of words every so often just really <laughs> often <out>. yeah <laughs> it would be just as rabbit holeish. yeah <laughs> and the cover is excellent and once again and i didn't have it because i had the proof but once again, it's, as many people who come into my bookstore, as many times as you hear, you can't judge a book by its cover. Every single person who comes into my bookstore judges a book by its cover. And <laughs> a really good one. And so, but it is, you love the idea of birds. Yeah, uh -huh. I mean, so I think that cover that you might have there is the UK edition. Um, but luckily, yes. the, the US one also has a peacock on it. So um, they have taken that bird motif, that ornith ornithological uh, approach, and they've applied it too. So I'm, I'm thrilled that there are flocks on both of our uh, continents <laughs> coming your way. That's so funny. I'm looking out my window at my peacock. Um, I have two peacocks. Great sentence. That's <laughs> my next novel. Yeah. Um, yes, I'm looking at my peacock. Um, He's an asshole. And <laughs> I hate both of them. I just got them a peahen because they've been sexually frustrated for at least nine years. And I thought, but now there's one peahen and two peacocks and I'm worried about. Oh dear. Well, Hope that's where the young tat comes in and just take one of their wings away. <laughs> they'll, they'll find, <laughs> they'll be happy. <laughs> they, hate, they hate me and I hate them. And then after I got them, I realized that their life expectancy is between 20 and 40 years. So I realized, that they will be at my funeral, mocking <laughs> Everyone in black, apart from these very showy, <laughs> like exuberant, flamboyant birds. Well, they look at me like uh, the doctor's bird looks at Winsworth and look at me like the pelican does. It's like, yeah. it's like a cat might do sometimes, where he just looks at you like, you know, you're totally worthless, and I'm <laughs> not there in the slightest about you. Yeah. There's a book I read and I interviewed the author recently and uh, after the woman has a stroke, she can talk to dogs and cats <laughs> mm. and her husband is home, is late, she doesn't know where he is and the dog and the cat are there and she asks the dog and the cat, do you think he'll be all right? And the dog says, he'll be fine, don't worry, he'll be home soon. And the cat says, why should I care? <laughs> and the peacock's like he won't get home safe <laughs> like oh god no the peacocks see me coming and they well one time it's because and this is we're done with the book and it's just me <laughs> i have so two peacocks three goats an alpaca i used to have 12 um a cat a strange dog um chickens and sometimes in the morning i'll go up um to the paddock and they'll all be together Wow. And I know they're talking about me. Yeah, the, you, you turn around the corner and they're like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> never mind, see you later. <laughs> wow. And I know. Why is the dog strange? Why is, why is... Well, he's a golden doodle and he's 80 pounds and he's really, really goofy. And, he, you know, he gets up on the sink and drinks water out of the sink. And sometimes he'll watch TV, but he likes Wheel of Fortune. And <laughs> he likes to watch horse racing, Wheel of Fortune... And he likes to get up on the dresser and look at himself in the mirror for a long time, just 
just looking as if he's primping. So I think he's got life sorted. <laughs> like, that's perfect. He does, really? but he's he's nonsensical as well, which makes it all. Okay, so I'm done with myself, and and I I've, I've done as much book as, of of your book as I think is practicable. But I really lo- obviously you can tell I really loved it. It's it was I'm interviewing someone later today that I didn't really love their book, but I won't say who it is, obviously. <laughs> And it's like at one o'clock and I'm really dreading it. And I don't know what to ask. So I don't know just to... ask them like, oh, how's the weather? And then they'll probably go at length about that. And you can be like, well, anyway, that was great. Is that the time? Anyway, well, well I can do what I could also do what Terry Gross on PBS or, and NPR would do or on Good Morning America when you're interviewed. And I'll say, so what's your book about? What how do you write in the morning? What's your schedule? <laughs> Books. I reckon authors. just say like, well, what is a book? And then just see what they come up with. Why? <laughs> um, oh, well, I hope it goes well. And thank you so much for, for having me on, on Publication Day. That's It's really great to talk about it. And Yeah, um, I, I'm so it. happy you came. And um, yeah, hopefully we'll talk to you again sometime. That'd be great. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.